Good morning or afternoon, whatever time it might be. Uh, my name is Tim Bunning. I am uh, what's called the Chief Technology Officer here at the Air Force Research Laboratory. A lot of people ask me what that means. Uh, my wife, who always used to call me a geek, uh, because I've had a passion for science and engineering my entire career, and now calls me the chief geek. Uh, but seriously, I, I represent the, the headquarters section of AFRL. I am the senior ST advisor to General Pringle. Uh, AFRL is a great place. Uh, spent my career here, and we're going to talk a little bit today about some optics. Uh, I'm going to give you a sense of what my research used to be. And it was centered around optics to try to introduce uh, the importance of optics. And then we'll uh, break from this shot and then do a few uh, demos uh, using some lasers and some transparent optical systems like lenses and prisms, etc. So, can me by training, uh, but my, my degree focused on a class of materials called liquid crystals. Liquid crystals everyone is aware of because you use them every day in your computer uh, with your crystal display. They're a class of materials that have ordering properties. So think, think of a, a bunch of matches that you would put in a box and shake the box. The matches would more or less line in a single direction due to the energies of interactions. Or think of a bunch of logs floating down a river. Given enough time, most of the logs will be pointed down the river. So you'll have pockets where the, the logs will be more or less parallel to one another. And that, that's the basis of a liquid crystal. The liquid crystal has that crystalline ordered behavior, but it's also a fluid. And so with a field, with heat, with mechanical impetus, you, you can get it to change orientation. And when you change that orientation, you change the optical properties. So simplistically, my, my research coming up through the ranks was to figure out how to use liquid crystals to dynamically change the optics uh, of a particular scenario. What is that scenario? Well, it turns out that in the Air Force, we have lots of lasers. We have lots of detectors. We, we rely on things called ISR, Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance. We, we view the world. This is how we understand what's going on. It's how we uh, fly over other countries and see what's going on. We see in a variety of regions. But, but our ability to have situational awareness and be able to react is all based on being able to see. Uh, just like when you're driving down the road, in your car, you wouldn't want someone to put a blindfold on you or, or have you close your eyes for a of time. We need to be able to see them to be able to function. And it turns out that lasers can do some bad things to those systems that we are using to look at. Uh, classic, simple example that people might be able to relate to is if you've ever looked into a camera with a flash and been very close, and, and the flash is going off. It has dazzled you. It has dazzled your eyes. And it, it, it impedes your ability to be able to see uh, in, in the immediacy. And so, simplistically, the group I worked in was trying to build technologies that we could put in front of things, in front of eyes, in front of detectors, that would mitigate the effects of lasers. Now, if you have a really big laser, you can do some really bad things. And so this is a solid block of plastic that we've taken very high power lasers and, and essentially drilled holes into it. And so to protect against lasers that are this big, well, you almost need a manhole cover in front of the systems. And so that wasn't the, the work that we were trying to do. To be able to block a laser like this, you need to put a big piece of metal in front and you are protected but you can no longer see. And so the question is, is how do you enable protection while still being allowed to see while the laser's there? And that's where optics comes in because what you wanna be able to do is you wanna be able to selectively get rid of the bad light while you are uh, constructively using the good light. And that's where my research into liquid crystals came in. So you say, well, 
this this is a little bit of a fantasy people out there running around with really high power lasers but you know we in the air force own the night this is a pair of night vision goggles very very uh sensitive and if i was in my living room right now and it was pitch black nighttime and i took my tv ir remote and i flashed it in front of this it would it would do the same thing that the flash uh the camera flashed into your eyes to this thing and so the key is, is how do you build things that can go on the front of this or embedded in here that will protect against those sort of effects and so that's where uh, liquid crystals come in which is why i'm going to show you a few demos of uh through my career uh before we get there you need to understand that there's really four things that you do with light i got a light source and i have a detector I can do one of four things, uh, simplistically. I can bounce the light back, that's called reflection. And every morning when you brush your teeth and you look in the mirror, you're getting a reflection of yourself. So you can either reflect all of the spectrum, like a metallic mirror, or you can build structures which will only reflect one wavelength while allowing the rest of the wavelengths to go through. You can refract light, and that just means you bringing light beams in it, it it interfaces with something in it the light gets bent much like a lens either bent away or bent in the third thing you can do is you can absorb light so a uh, bag of doritos orange color it's due to the fact that there's a dye there blue kool-aid why is it blue there's a dye there and it's selectively absorbing part of the light that goes in and only allowing the rest of the colors to and then the last thing you can do is you can scatter the light. So think of milk. Milk is fat globules in water. And the light, because of the size of the, the fat glob globules, the light is just naturally scattered away. So it looks, it looks white. And in fact, a liquid crystal, if you had a vial of it, it would look like milk because it is very cloudy until you align it uh, into a macroscopic thing. So, what are we going to do? Uh, well, we're going to, from a liquid crystal perspective, there's, there's different things you can do, and that's what I'm going to talk about here uh, in a little bit. Uh, the first thing you can do is you can essentially build a dynamic scatterer. So and I, I have an example of that shown here. So you, you can't see me through here. This is a window. This window has microscopic balls of liquid crystal embedded in a polymer matrix so think of swiss cheese i got a polymer so i got a matrix of some sort of plastic and then i have holes in that plastic in those holes i have liquid crystal fluid and the liquid crystal fluid is randomly oriented across all of the droplets within the cheese now if i apply a field to that i will align all of the liquid crystals in this way towards the camera and what that does is it will eliminate the scattering and the window will become transparent. So you can see now that it's transparent, it's got a little bit of haze because I haven't used it in a while. But it's essentially an example of a dynamic scattering system. And all you're really doing is you're moving the liquid crystal around in a, in a matrix of material that has either a match refractive index or a non-match refractive index. And we'll talk about what refractive index is uh, here in a little bit. So there are more, uh, I guess, elegant uh, liquid crystal systems. And, and that's really where my career has been based. So if I, if I think of these logs floating down a river, and if I think I have multiple rivers stacked upon each other, just go with me here, multiple rivers stacked upon each other, and I have a slight tilt to the direction of each river relative to the other, I will build a helical structure. And if I build that structure so that the, the, the pitch distance, or the screw length, if you will, to go on, 360 degrees, much like a box spring on a car. If I build that to be of the wavelength of light, I get what's called a colosteric liquid crystal. And it's, a, in essence, a one-dimensional grading 
which now reflects light only at the period that the spring is picking out. And that's shown here in film form. This is an example of a cholesteric thin film that is only reflecting in the orange. If it wasn't on black paper, you would see the complementary color of that. And if I change the screw length, I can change, I can change the color. So I could put this on the front of the NVG and I would be protected against blue light, blue light only. The key is how do you protect against all of it? And that's where you use the dynamic properties of the liquid crystal, the ability to be able to change the color or be able to put multiple systems together to be able to tile the window. And so we have a couple of examples here. This is a ski goggle that has been outfitted with a thin film of cholesteric liquid crystal. And what we're going to do is I'm going to apply voltage to it. Right now it's in the uh, tran it's, it's in the reflecting state. And so it's only reflecting light of the orange color. And when I apply the field, I'm going to disrupt the order and it's going to go completely black, hopefully. And so this would be an example of something you would, you know, give out to somebody who wants to be able to work. I haven't pressed the button yet. Wants to be able to work, but then in, in the advent of a, uh, you know, bad light source, you'd be able to protect yourself. Much like a welding goggle protects itself, you know. Welding goggle is transparent, and when you, you, you hit the arc, a bright flash happens, it immediately transforms itself into a highly absorbing film, a black film. And that's exactly what's going to happen here, hopefully. Maybe. There it goes. Hopefully the camera is picking it up. And then we have another example, which is on the same theme. In this case, this is what would be called neutral. So it's, it's a gray background. So you'd use this in different lighting conditions than when you would use this. And this one also will go hopefully very black. So it, uh, it's completely black right now. I would not want to be driving down the street with that. In fact, the small companies that, you know, the Air Force Research Lab, we do a lot of business with small companies. Uh, to do risk reduction on our technologies. This small company, they have now brought commercial product uh, to the market. Again, not for my application, but the application is for uh, high-end motorcycle riders and high-end bicyclists who don't have the time to be able to uh, change the tint on their goggles. And you can think of people going in and out of tunnels like in the Tour de France, and, uh, and so they, they develop and are now selling a whole range of uh, spectacles that uh, dynamically change their optical properties depending on the lighting conditions around them. In a similar manner that transition eyewear does, right? We're all familiar with transition eyewear. You walk out in the sun and they, they slowly darken. Key here with this technology, and particularly for my interest, is being able to do it very quickly. And we want, we want to be able to see, and then we want to be able to see when, when something very quickly comes in. So with that, uh, I think we're going to transition out of this. And again, reflection, refraction, absorption, scattering, the key to understanding the world around us. It's what your eyes are perceiving. It's what cameras perceive. It's what uh, the whole... Uh, surveillance ecosystem is based on. And to understand those, uh, there's a concept called refractive index and Snell's law. And we're going to transition to a close-up shot of some activity that we're going to do with lenses, where the lenses have different shapes and they have different refractive indices. And because of that, when you put them in front of a light source like a laser, you will 
uh, move the beam around, if you will, uh, and if you do that in an advantageous way, which we'll show at the end of the lesson, you can actually get into doing things like cloaking. H.G. Wells, The Invisible Land, uh, probably our first foray into modern culture. I really like the Predator movie, back when the alien landed on, the, on uh, this planet, and uh, you know he would do a little thing on his wrist and he'd make himself go invisible, uh, and he would be seeing in the IR, he would see the heat signatures. Of late, Harry Potter, uh, clearly has brought that back to the fore with uh, the invisibility cloak, if you will. And so we are getting very advanced in our optical design and our understanding of optics. And, and so there's actually a move afoot to be able to bring to realization the, the uh, experimental demonstration of such cloaking. Uh, uh, demonstrations and you'll do such one in one of your upcoming lessons. Welcome back everyone. Uh, I think you can see three laser beams uh, going through a 360 degree circumference. I believe you can see a box over here with a bunch of what I would call glass optics. They're transparent optics so they primarily will refract light. So we're gonna talk a little bit here about refraction. Uh, I mentioned earlier that really four things you can do simplistically. You can reflect the light, you can refract the light, you can uh, absorb the light, and you can scatter the light. And that's really how you affect how a laser beam from point A gets point B or doesn't get to point B if you will. And so to talk about refraction you need to understand Snell's law. Snell's law is very very simple it just says that light when it propagates in other materials is affected by the property of that material and that property is called the refractive index. So essentially light will slow down in materials that are not air or vacuum. And, and what that does is it causes when you have a, a non-planar interface, it forces light to be bent, i.e. refracted, in a manner which is relative to the angle that the light is imparting into the surface. And we're going to have a, a few demos here just to show you that. I'm going to put down on the paper here a what's called a double convex lens so it is bent outwards on both sides and so the light coming in is uh, bent at the first interface and then bent at the second interface and you can see that uh, the light is focused to where my finger is which is more or less at the interface of the box with with the piece of paper and again, that's due to the fact that as light passes from air to solid material, and then from solid material back into air, it is bent. And it is bent based on Snell's law, the relationship of the, the refractive indice difference between the two medium. Now, if I make the convex lens uh, have a steeper, a steeper, angle, if you will, by making it more curved in simple terms, you can see that I've moved the focal point from where it was, which is more or less at this interface, I have moved the focal point here probably up, oh I don't know, what is that, about two inches. And so this is really the fundamental design principle that we use in something called geometrical optics. And so most optical systems, cameras, LiDAR systems in your car for, you know, self-driving cars, just, just about any optical system is based on uh, geometrical optics and, and it's based on the ability to move the light around uh, in a manner which you want. So we can now show a con, what's, what's number three do? Uh, this looks like this has 
less curvature and you can see that the three beams do not come to a point. The focal point is probably out here in the middle of the, of the box somewhere. We got a lens four, which shows even further. So again, now the focal point is way out there. Now if I change the curvature and I invert it, I will get something where instead of focusing the beams to a point, I am now spreading the beams, uh, in this case, out to ad infinitum. And this is shown here by, by lens five. And so you can do all sorts of crazy experiments with, with these sort of optics, and I think you will in your class. Ooh, this shows a mirrored surface. Interesting. I think this is all going back, though I see three points projected. Never put your eye into a laser for people. So let's talk about eyes. Uh, maybe give this a little bit more of a real world example. So now you should see a schematic of an eye, if you will, uh, where you have in incoming beams into the, the lens, shown here, There's one uh, as shown schematically, and then the optic nerve on the back side. And with a normal, normal lens, this is what happens. Light comes in, it's captured by the curvature of our eye and our lens and it is focused to a point on the back of our eye where the rest of the optics uh, does its thing. It translates that uh, optical signal uh, and it's processed by the, the, the brain and, and, and thus we, we see things. Now, what happens when the eye isn't functioning? Well, I wear glasses, as do many, and you can either be nearsighted or farsighted. So this is an example where you're nearsighted and that the focus of the beam is not where it should be. It's actually in the middle of the eye somewhere and so that what you see on the back of the eye, which is what is being imaged and sent to your brain, uh, is fuzzy. And it's nearsighted, which means I can't see far in this configuration. Now. Now I correct that with the right optic, which is what my glasses do. And now you can see that I've shifted where the focal point was, which was in the middle of the eye, back to where it needs to be, which is on the back of the eye. And conversely, if I'm farsighted, I now see that my focus is past the back of the eye, again, giving me a blurry image. But again, I can correct that with the right set of optics to put the focus at the back of the eye. So these are the principles that you're gonna use uh, when you guys build a cloaking, a simple cloaking demo, if you will, and you're going to basically use the principle of geometric optics to uh, move the beams around in such a way that when looking back towards light, uh, back towards the image, uh, you masked what you see. And so it appears, it appears as a cloak. Uh, and this is something that you know has fascinated humans for the, a long time. In the Air Force, like I remember a movie, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, where if you could take an airplane, think of an airplane flying against the sky, we now can see that airplane against the sky, against the blue, against the clouds. If I had really, really fast computers and I could digitally change what my eye was looking at, on the side of the airplane that I was looking at to match what was behind the airplane, i.e. the blue or the clouds, you could make your airplane essentially become invisible. And so thus there's a lot of interest in this uh, principle of cloaking for a whole range of uh, applications that not only affect the commercial world but also the military world. All right.
I want to thank everyone uh, for participating. I want to thank the Education Outreach Office and uh, the, the WOW Office, as it's called. I'm, I'm in their studio right now taping this. They do great work, uh, you know, pushing the forefront of uh, hands-on learning and STEM activities uh, across our community. Uh, just kudos to them. Kudos to them for inviting me down here and letting me ad-lib uh, during this. Uh, you know, science is a great thing. Uh, you know, go into it, I would say. I went into it, I didn't know what I was going to become when I, when I went into it, and that's okay. So don't think you have to have it figured out to go into it, but uh, be curious, ask questions. And uh, again, I thank everyone for participating.